So welcome to uh, UCI Great Big Read. We're really pleased to bring with you um, today a special author series. And I'd like to first introduce our Vice Chancellor, Douglas Haynes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Uh, good afternoon. I want to warmly welcome you to this installment of the UCI Great Big Read. Even though we are apart, I am so grateful that you've made a commitment to be in community this afternoon and share ideas and perspectives. It is quite true that the current pandemic has literally and figuratively shifted the ground from under our feet as we work and learn remotely. It is no less imperative that we acknowledge the very ground on which UCI campus is located. To this end, I want to acknowledge that our presence is on the ancestral and traditional and unceded territory of the Ashaman and Tongva peoples. The UCI Great Big Read is a partnership with the Office of Inclusive Excellence, the UCI Libraries and the Division of Student Affairs. This program was created by OIE to promote greater community and solidarity related to diverse identities equity and inclusion amid the current pandemic and the challenges we face in physically distancing. Today, we welcome Tommy Orange, the author of the novel, There, There. Our UCI great big read of his novel was voted by you. And I know that events that included a past book club conversation and a DYI zine making workshop on this novel was well attended and engaging. I am particularly pleased to have the author present to reflect on so many changes that we've seen in the two years since his book's release, as well as to note the resiliency of this work. I think that we can all agree that it is important for any progress to be made on diversity efforts to first take stock where we are. Mr. Orange's multi-voice novel is a perfect means for us to view the different perspectives and factual corrections needed to advance inclusion for indigenous communities. I want to recognize and thank my colleague, Professor Alicia Carroll for joining us today to facilitate a conversation with our guests. Professor Carroll's expansive research focused on 19th century American literature and issues germane to Native American and indigenous literature and cultural studies provide us with an exceptional guidance through our own conversations today. And shortly after I introduce Mr. Orange and he shares a brief reading with us, Professor Carroll will broach some of the questions from our participants in conversation with our guests. I'm particularly privileged to welcome Tommy Orange to this event and grateful for his participation Mr. Orange is a native of Oakland, California, citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations of Oklahoma. His insights in There, There have garnered broad literary and popular acclaim. With the debut of his novel in 2018, Mr. Orange received the Penn Hemingway Award for Distinguished New Novel, as well as the National Book Critics Circle Award for Best New Book, and the first novel prize from the Center for Fiction. And he was a finalist for the, 19, for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. I'm excited. I am so excited to hear from a recent interview that Mr. Orange is writing a sequel to this special novel titled Wandering Stars. And this gives us all something to look forward to. Please join me in welcoming Tommy Orange to the UCI Great Big Read. Hi, thanks Hello, so much, <laughs> Douglas, for that. <clears throat> um, I just got an uh, alarming message that said that my internet is unstable. So I just wanna make sure I'm coming through clearly, am I? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, so I think I'm going to read um, something from the prologue. Um, November 29th was the 
um, I guess you have to call it anniversary of the Sand Creek Massacre. And I was especially reflecting on this. Um, I, I was gonna write, I was asked to write something in a really short timeline. So I say that I was thinking about it um, because I was supposed to write something and it was too fast. So I just got to the place of thinking about it. Uh, and it was related to, the premise was like, what's life gonna be like after Trump? And you know, you were supposed to come up with whatever that was. And I was thinking about, I was listening to, I think I was hate listening to a podcast um, for QAnon people, um, just like listening to their, dis <laughs> their, their scrambling for reasons why this is all still part of the plan. Um, and I was just listening to their level of distrust and what it would look like going forward. And uh, just thinking about reflecting on how I've never trusted institutions or the government um, and was raised hearing this massacre story from my dad as like, this is who we are. This was a story that he repeated to us in a way that uh, I tried to capture some of the cadence and the way that he talked about it in the book was the way he told us. Um, and he wasn't telling us um, as a cautionary tale. It was just part of our import important part of our history. Um, so I was reflecting on it because you know, from the very beginning, this is what I was hearing about my relationship to the US government and what happened to our people and how to proceed with institutions that were telling me a very different story at school. Um, and then also thinking about how people who feel disenfranchised now, who who prior to these times maybe had or were born into the privilege of trusting the system that they were born into and that it benefited them to some extent. And just seeing some of those people feel disenfranchised now um, I was maybe getting some pleasure in it, which is not healthy, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from the prologue okay. uh, related, related to that um, <clears throat> and, the, and just the section right after that. Massacre as prologue. Some of us grew up with stories about massacres, stories about what happened to our people not so long ago how we came out of it. At Sand Creek, we heard it said that they mowed us down with their howitzers. Volunteer militia under Colonel John Shivington came to kill us. We were mostly women, children, and elders. The men were away to hunt. They told us to fly the American flag. We flew that and the white one too. Surrender, the white flag waved. We stood under both flags as they came at us, they did more than kill us. They tore us up, mutilated us, broke our fingers to take our rings, cut off our ears to take our silver, scalped us for our hair. We hid in the hollows of tree trunks, buried ourselves in sand by the riverbank. That same day ran red with blood. That same sand, sorry, ran red with blood. They tore unborn babies out of bellies took what we intended to be our children before they were children, babies before they were babies. They ripped them out of our bellies. They broke soft baby heads against trees. Then they took our body parts as trophies and displayed them on a stage in downtown Denver. Colonel Shivington danced with dismembered parts of us in his hands. With women's pubic hair, drunk, he danced. And the crowd gathered there before him was all the worse for cheering and laughing along with him. It was a celebration. Hard, fast. Getting us to cities was supposed to be the final necessary step in our assimilation, absorption, erasure, the completion of a 500 year old genocidal campaign. But the city made us new and we made it ours. We didn't get lost amid the sprawl of tall buildings, the stream of anonymous masses, the ceaseless din of traffic. We found one another, started up Indian centers, brought out our families and powwows, our dances, our songs, our beadwork. We bought and rented homes, slept on the streets, under freeways. We went to school, joined the armed forces, populated Indian bars in the Fruitvale in Oakland and in the Mission in San Francisco. We lived in boxcar villages in Richmond. We made art and we made babies and we made way for our people to go back and forth between reservation and city. We did not move to cities to die. The sidewalks and streets, the concrete absorbed our heaviness. The glass, metal, rubber, and wires, the speed, the hurtling masses. The city took us in. We were not urban Indians then. This was part of the Indian Relocation Act, 
which was part of the Indian termination policy, which was and is exactly what it sounds like, make them look and act like us, become us, and so disappear. But it wasn't just like that. Plenty of us came by choice to start over, to make money or for a new experience. Some of us came to cities to escape the reservation. We stayed after fighting in the Second World War, after Vietnam too. We stayed because the city sounds like a war and you can't leave a war once you've been. You can only keep it at bay, which is easier when you can see and hear it near you. At fast metal, at constant firing around you, cars up and down the streets and freeways like bullets. The quiet of the reservation, the sight of the highway towns, rural communities, that kind of silence just makes the sound of your brain on fire that much more pronounced. Plenty of us are urban now, if not because we live in cities, then because we live on the internet, inside the high rise of multiple browser windows. They used to call us sidewalk Indians, called us citified, superficial, inauthentic, cultureless refugees, apples. An apple is red on the outside and white on the inside. But what we are is what our ancestors did, how they survived. We are the memories we don't remember, which live in us, which we feel, which make us sing and dance and pray the way we do. Feelings from memories that flare and bloom unexpectedly in our lives like blood through a blanket from a wound made by a bullet fired by a man shooting us in the back for our hair, for our heads, for a bounty, or just to get rid of us. When they came for us with their bullets, we didn't stop moving, even though the bullets moved twice as fast as the sound of our screams. And even when their heat and speed broke our skin, shattered our bones, skulls, pierced our hearts, we kept on. Even when we saw the bullets send our bodies flailing through the air like flags, like the many flags and buildings that went up in place of everything we knew this land to be before. The bullets were premonitions, ghosts from dreams of a hard, fast future. The bullets moved on after moving through us, became the promise of what was to come, the speed and the killing, the hard, fast lines of borders and buildings. They took everything and ground it down to dust as fine as gunpowder. They fired their guns into the air in victory and the strays flew out into the nothingness of histories written wrong and meant to be forgotten. Stray bullets and consequences are landing on our unsuspecting bodies even now. Thank you. <clears throat> Tommy, thank you so much for that powerful reading. I, I now want to uh, invite Professor Alicia Cox to uh, facilitate the question and answers. Uh. I uh, thank you so much for being here, Tommy. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to meet you and speak with you about your wonderful book. Uh, my name is Alicia Carroll. My last name's changed in the last year, and I am uh, sitting here in uh, Long Beach, California, which is also unceded Tongva and Hachiman land. And um, I'm so glad that you chose this passage to read today because the moment I saw you on the screen and saw your shirt that you're wearing, no one is illegal on stolen land. I immediately thought of this passage on um, page nine that you read about um, the goal of, of Indian assimilation policy, federal assimilation policy, that uh, the Indian Relocation Act and Indian termination policy was part and parcel of um, make them look and act like us, become us and so disappear. And I've been thinking about the um, relevance of these policies for Native American people um, on this, you know, uh, continent that has been colonized by the United States and indigenous peoples who are coming here from elsewhere, from Mexico and places in Central and South America and the pressures that um, immigrants face when they arrive to speak English and become Americanized and, um, you know, just the irony that so many of these people who are being locked in cages, you know, you're talking about the, the Trump administration, are Indigenous peoples. Um, and, yeah, just really um, curious about 
your decision to write and include this prologue. I think it's very unique to your novel. Um, and I have, you know, a lot of questions uh, in general about your choices of format and who are your literary influences and how they shaped you. But um, I wanted to begin with um, questions that were submitted by readers ahead of time. I'm not sure if you have been provided with a copy of these questions or if I should read them. Okay. Um, it's so, okay. I don't, I don't, yeah. Yeah. So there are a few questions that were submitted uh, as of yesterday and a few that I see in the QA that I'll get to in a moment. Um, so the first question is about gender and generation. Someone is asking about um, wanting to hear more about the roles of gender and generation in the novel, thinking about older characters as well as female ones. And I might add to that question, um, my, um, my own question about the significance of how you write about um, patriarchy and the imposition of patriarchy onto indigenous peoples through settler colonial processes. You talk a lot about um, last names and um, uh, I wanna say machismo in the AIM movement, missing and murdered indigenous women and people like that. So I'd like to begin, you know, thinking of um, questions about gender and, and generations, intergenerational mm -hmm. matters. So um, whenever I answer questions about the book, it's always, um, it's always half, I knew what I was doing um, and half the process is a mystery to me. Um, and so, you know, I didn't go into it wanting to write, um, a character like Opal, um, to represent an older generation who'd been through this civil rights era activism. Um, I had been to Alcatraz with, we took, uh, for a native youth suicide prevention grant, we took, um, youth, native youth from Oakland to Alcatraz and through the, the, um, because it's a national park um, through their services. We got like a private tour and we brought elders who were there at the time. And uh, I watched, I had, uh, I was training one of the youth to, to do audio recording. That's part of my background is in sound engineering. That was before I was a writer, I was a musician and I went to school for sound engineering. Um, so I was watching him learn how to record an elder, talk to the youth about her time there. And uh see see that sort of seeing through the lens of them the youth there um really made me wonder about the childhood perspective um what that would have been like um and and as you referenced the machismo of the aim movement and the patriarchy and um what it what i imagined it would have been like and and from what i read was like to some extent um this sort of male dominated triumphant narrative um is something that we've heard and it, I was just very curious about what it would look like uh, from a child's perspective, what the whole scene would look like, and then what that would do, what that eventually would do to someone as they were older. And so the Opal character, uh, she came to me, you know, as a little girl on the island. And I spent a lot of years, probably more years than any other character on her to try to flesh her out, having the innocence of a girl at that time and then having the sort of wisdom um, and uh, retrospective, introspective, uh, reflective sort of point of view when she's older. Um, and, you know, part of that is, part of her is me um, reacting to my parents' idealism. They were both kind of on fire for God. My, my mom and the evangelical church in East Oakland and my dad, uh, Native American church in peyote ceremony. Um, so her reaction to her mom and her idealism and activism is sort of like me, but then her, her hesitancy to talk with the boys about 
uh, their background and about being native and what it means and how to qualify actually comes from my dad who you know, was very quiet growing up. Um, he worked a lot. He was an engineer at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Um, and he, you know, he went to Cal for Native American studies and his first language is Cheyenne and he's very steeped in the culture. But there was a lot he didn't want to say transmit or uh, didn't want us to be affected by because he also carried a lot of pain from his past. And so what I wanted to get into through her as a character had to do with my own upbringing and my dad's and um, and how it's complex sometimes to pass on. You know, it's not always as easy as here's how to hit the hand drum and sing this high note and harmonize with it. Um, and this is beautiful culture to pass on and to talk about in public when somebody wants to authenticate you and your cultural practices. It's often very complex. And if you've been, if you've been raised by a generation that was taught to assimilate, it's not simple at all in terms of like, this is how you are native. And I was passed on to me from this person. Like it's it, in most cases that, that I've heard about, you know, it, a lot of people went to boarding school and you were punished for speaking your language and for uh, practicing anything that had to do with your culture. So the erasure and the assimilation, uh, I come from a generation of, of uh, you know, those were my parents or that was my dad. And um, so that, this is all stuff I was trying to capture in the characters. And, you know, Opal came out as a little girl and um, I, I have strong native women in the book uh, because I've had that experience in my life and my family. And in, in Oakland, there's a lot of women leaders in the native world, a lot of uh, strong native women leaders and um and you know a lot of times men are garbage in general so I also that's just that way it came out thank you so much for speaking about your autobiographical influences that was one of the things that really struck me this um sort of autobiographical element at times I wondered if the character of Dean Oxendine is that how you pronounce that character yeah. mm -hmm. if that was sort of your avatar you know, doing this oral history project and um, um, trying to showcase the stories and lives of Native folks living in Oakland. And it seems like that's what this book is doing. And I was curious about if any of the characters in these book, in this novel are based on people who you knew or people who you had interviewed. Um, there sure. are a couple of questions about metaphor and symbolism in the novel that I think make a good segue from talking about um, autobiography and, um, and gender. The first asks about mirrors. Uh, so many of the novel's characters struggle with seeing themselves and being seen. I was struck by the number of scenes in which a character, especially men, find themselves in front of a mirror, imagining how others see them. Was the mirror a consciously deployed metaphor? And the related question about symbolism in the novel asks about the spider's legs uh, found in the skins of certain characters. What is the meaning of this episode? And um, the references to the spider's web as both a home and a trap. Okay. Um... So the mirror thing, when I first was asked this question, when I first went out with the book and uh, uh, hold on one second, um, there's a, pu I have a puppy that's crying. Oh. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q and A. Any of you in there right now? Usually my son's on puppy duty, but he's, uh, not around right now. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> initially, when I was answering this, the question about mirrors, when it has been asked before, um, as with a lot of questions when first asked about the book, what, what, what was I doing with this or that? Um, and I like that the question included what, the intentionality of the metaphor. Um, I did not necessarily have um, any intention aside from, 
you know, I knew that I was threading certain things through uh, an image and how we look and are we seen as native and being defined by the outside and authenticity is all stuff that I'm playing with. Um, and I think the only thing that I had in mind was related to never seeing ourselves depicted on a screen when we look at the screen so much and the mirror being so much like screen. So having these characters in her face, you know, and the book opens with this Indian head test pattern. Um, and so these characters are kind of gauging themselves in the mirror about like their Indianness. Um, so I, I just, I wanted that um, to be a sort of a screen reference, them looking at themselves, that being the place that they have to look, to see themselves and reflect on, um, you know, how they appear because that's so often how native people are sort of forced into thinking about themselves uh, because we've been defined by the outside and not been allowed our own self-generated reflection and uh, definition. Um, and the other part to the question, I, I wasn't sure if you were asking about the Dean avatar because uh, that was before this question. Uh, I will say that um, I did go in front of a cultural arts um, panel in Oakland uh, for a storytelling grant, and I did get it. Um, the other parts of Dean are not me. Um, so the, the big difference here is that Dean did do the project and my project was doing Dean. Um, so was the, I apologize to the, the cultural arts grant people um, for not using the money the way I said I would. Um, and fortunately, they're all fans of the book and I got to have lunch with the mayor of Oakland and the person who was cutting my checks for the cultural arts grant for two years and uh, all was forgiven because they liked the book. So, um, oh, the spider lakes was the other part. Um, so the spider lakes thing, um, this is gross, uh, but I don't mind sharing because I have before and um, I don't think it's that gross. I think it's weird. Um, I pulled two spider legs out of my own leg um, while I was writing the book. And I already had some spider language written into it. Um, so I, I sort of knew I was gonna be working with it in a way. Um, the structure, I, you know, I, I wanted it to be kind of spider webby. Um, and the language for home and trap came later, but, uh, but I actually just pulled two spider legs out of my leg I scoured the internet for answers or for stories, just like Orville did and found nothing. Um, I called my dad and um, he said, uh, he said, it sounds to me like you got witched. And I was like, well, what do I do? Um, and he said, I'll pray for you. And that was it. So um, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know what to do with it. And, and it seemed like it, belonged in fiction so that that's where it ended up uh, so the meaning you know I had to do some work to admit to have it to have the meaning happen with some of the metaphor and the language that the characters use around home and trap uh, but the actual legs just came from me it happening to me and me not knowing what to do about that Beautiful. Um, the there's a hopefully a simple question. Um, someone wonders about the book's dedication to Kateri and Felix and what is their relationship to you? Oh, it's my wife and son. Okay, easy. Um, there are, there's a question about um, land acknowledgements and, you know, both um, Vice Chancellor Haynes and I myself have recognized that we're on Tongva and Ahashiman land. And this person wants to know, what are your thoughts about land acknowledgements? What are the benefits, the potential drawbacks? I think it's a, it's an essential step. And if it, if it's seen as an arrival, then it's problematic. It's a step toward, you know, in Canada, they have this truth and reconciliation thing that they're trying to do that it's a lot more progressive than uh, the what direction we were headed with Trump trying to put in like a, some kind of patriotic education nonsense when that's already what public institutionalized education is. Um, I don't know what 
education he thinks he was trying to change. Um, but uh, as long as it's seen as a, a step toward general acknowledgement, historical acknowledgement about the foundations of this country and it history's effects on people and systems and, and critical thinking around all of this stuff as a step toward, um, you know, righting wrongs and, and, and seeing things as they are together uh, as a collective. Um, so I think they're, the only space there is to criticize them is, is if people sort of are patting themselves on the back and feel like as long as we're acknowledging and doing due diligence to, to just know this little bit about where we currently are, uh, then that's, that's when it's problematic. But you know what, it's just now being widely um, used and I don't know, I only see it happening in my events and it's like a native person in their book. I don't know if it's happening in like other spaces where it's not a native subject. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to grow. And if, as long as it's a step and everyone sees it as a step towards something, I think it's great. Yeah. I think in the Zoom space, it can be really cool because people can be all over the country and it can force them to think about what native land they're on as opposed to like the one, we're all in the same space. It's just the one uh, tribe or several tribes that have the history there. Yes, thank you. Um, this next question is about um, motivations for writing and I think is related to uh, questions about literary influences um, and how they shape your choices of um, format and structure. It says, how do you channel your writing in, how do you channel in your writing the anger, frustration, and disappointment from broader events, treatment of indigenous peoples in the US, current injustices witnessed nationally towards such engaging and inspiring works while also balancing stark injustice? Is this an intentional approach in your writing to raise these dual and multiple understandings in your readers? Or do you believe this is just reality being witnessed? Some people will get it and others will not. I definitely think um, some people call the book angrier than I felt writing it, <laughs> especially certain parts of it. Um, and I think that's there's some level of um, the reader projecting what they think is must be anger, because if this happened, you must be outraged, which is fair. If you're, if you're, for instance, a white person, uh, just learning about certain aspects of history for the first time and it's being revealed to you in a sort of a um, plain spoken way without euphemism or anything like that maybe that could be seen as anger um, or angry um, and there is for sure rage um, so part of the I think part of the doing in the craft work on, on the sentence level if I were, if I were to see, sometimes I remove curse words entirely after having cursed a lot. And what I find when all, with all the curse words gone is that the anger remains. Um, and that's just a weird little craft thing that I've done, but I really, I really don't want to, um, have like a raw emotion. Um, if I'm trying to convey something, um, in a way that I, I, so when I was writing something like the prologue and the interlude, which once were just one big prologue, um, who I imagined would be reading it um, were other native writers. Cause I was, I finished it in an MFA program. I was trying to get the book published so I could get a teaching job there. And uh, in my wildest dreams, it, it would land at some small press. And then I'd, I could use that to get a job teaching. And then I'd make my students and my fellow colleagues would, uh, you know, feel pressured to read the book. And um, who I imagined reading were other Native writers. And a lot of Native people know what's in the book already. So to write something that what you already know, but to make it still stick and still be felt, that's what I was trying to do in writing it. So even if you knew about the Indian head test pattern, or you knew about you know the, the bullshit around Thanksgiving and the way that it's told, 
and you knew the real stories. I wanted to try to craft something that you still felt even if you knew it. Um, so that's, I think, where some of that emotion came from and the craft thinking that went into it. Um, but I didn't feel angry when I was writing it. I, I have a lot of feelings about uh, this country and what it means to be a native person, what it means to be a Cheyenne person. Um, and some of that comes out in writing and some of that, mm -hmm. um, some of that is uh, maybe I wield some of that, um, but not usually not intentionally. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, about other literary influences that I want to um, put together. And I wanted to start by saying, you know, you address in the novel the significance of the title. Um, there's, you know, the reference to the song There There by by the English rock band Radiohead. And there's the quotation from Gertrude Stein's Everybody's Autobiography in which they talk about their attempt to return to their childhood home in Oakland and find that the rural Oakland they remembered was gone and there is no there there. Um, and you write that Oakland represents quote, buried ancestral land, glass and concrete and wire and steel, unreturnable covered memory. There is no there there. And, um, you know, the, the questions I'm about to read are, they want to know about the novel's um, citations and engagements with Anglo and American culture and authors. Um, and I'll read those, but I also want to ask about, um, how indigenous cultures and indigenous stories and storytellers have influenced Anglo and American authors and cultural producers, because, you know, I think it goes, those influences go both ways. Um, so the first question is um, about how you use epigrams from some prominent writers, um, Brecht, Marius, Stein, Baudelaire, Genet, uh, and what was your process for finding these epigrams for this particular novel? And the second is um, asking about the references and allusions to some of Faulkner's work. Um, a point of contrast was at the end of Faulkner's novels, the perpetrators or their descendants have a reckoning or perhaps a karmic punishment in one form or another for their complicity. And it feels like this was a decision to not include those characters or events as part of their there. And, it, and wondering if you can talk about that. Sure, uh, let me start with the last part first, because I think it's the easiest to wrap up. Um, I haven't read any Faulkner. So I, whatever the illusions are, uh, I would love to hear about them um, one day or maybe I'll see them once I read Faulkner. I don't have anything wrong with him. Um, I just haven't read him. Um, I have a lot of holes in my education um, in, in terms of literary influence and who I've read. Um, and I guess this speaks to the epigrams. Um, so when I first got into literature, I referenced earlier that I was a musician before I was a writer. Um, the, the writers that really excited me about what writing was and what fiction was, um, a lot of those were um, works in translation. And because I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't a writer or a reader in school. I was an athlete. Before I was a musician, I was an athlete and uh, I did not do particularly well in school. And I, you know, I wasn't um, in any way encouraged to do well or, uh, you know, I went to community college after um, getting kicked out of one high school. And then uh, anyway, was not engaged in school, not interested. Um, so by the time I started becoming a reader, um, I knew how far behind I was and I went really hard at, and no one was telling me what to read or what not to read. So I worked at a used bookstore that was really huge 
and we didn't get very much business. So I had a lot of time to explore. Um, and uh, I just got into a lot of world literature. Kafka and Borges were like the first to really excite me. And Clarice Lispector from Brazil um, was really important to me along the way. Somebody like Robert Walzer really made me want to write. Um, so kind of, I had a lot of weird influences that um, I think when I, when I did read certain native literature at the time, when I first decided I wanted to start writing, um, there was a lot of reservation based references that made me feel like if I was going to be writing from a native perspective, that was the only way to do it because that was the only precedent that I knew about. Um, and I think I resisted for a while as a reader, a lot of the native canon um, because it didn't speak to my experience. And I, you know, I didn't read much American fiction or a lot of the stuff they have you read in school. Um, I, I didn't read any of that. Once, once I became a reader, I didn't really have that much interest in going back to uh, the classics. Um, so, so my influence as a, as a reader and a writer were more world literature than, than American. Um, but the Gertrude Stein quote came about um, from doing research uh, in thinking about writing a novel about Oakland. Um, there's, there's not that much. There's Gertrude Stein and there's Jack London. And then uh, Ishmael Reed has an amazing book, even though he wasn't um, born and raised in Oakland. He has an amazing book called The Blues Walk in Oakland. Um, so in, in doing some research about how other people were doing it, um, I came across the Gertrude Stein quote, and it, it, I think um, they're an amazing writer, um, brilliant and groundbreaking and experimental and um, musical. Um, but the quote to me was really powerful because it seemed to me that it, there's a lot of resonance with uh, Native experience and thinking about location and home and belonging and all of that, the mixed up convoluted nature of what it could mean to want to belong to a city um, and have no precedence for that in the way people think of you um, because native people belong in nature and, or a reservation or in, the his, in history, in the wilderness. Um, and so that was where that thinking came from. Uh, it was Oakland research and stumbling into Stein and not so much Jack Lennon, I'm not really a fan. Um, yeah, I really love- I think, I, did that answer all of the, the question? Did that answer I everything? I think so, except for the last part about how or why you decided to end it the way you did. Without oh, well, I, sense of I can- Sense of like or punishment. Sorry, I thought that was related to, in relation to Faulkner, something Faulkner yeah. did. Um, um, it, I always conceived of it as um, having a sort of cataclys cataclysmic tragic ending. Um, it's related to why the book has violence in it. Um, this is part of Native history that I was that I was working with. As I was finishing the book, um, Standing Rock was happening on TV and Trump just got elected. So if there was any chance I was going to change the ending to have something a little more rosy, that was not... I was literally finishing it between November 9th and December 9th of 2016. That was really not the time that it was going to get uh, any kind of bows at the end. Um, but I, but I always conceived of it as something that was going to end, um, you know, sort of cataclysmically and not necessarily good for everyone. Yeah. I really loved um, how you reclaim cities and urban spaces as land. Um, as native indigenous spaces uh, in the prologue. That's a point that uh, Karina Gould makes every time I hear her speak. She's an incredible indigenous feminist Ohlone leader um, local to Oakland. And, um, and this, this point about uh, Indians being urban, if not because we live in cities and because we live on the internet. And I was thinking about uh, the, char the native characters in the novel who use technology as tools, these 3D printers, drones, um, 
and the just this idea of reclaiming our vanity as part of nature and that cities belong to the earth i thought was a really important uh point of view um that resists this narrative that once an indian becomes urban then they're assimilated and they're no longer indian um and so i think maybe we have time for this one last question about um what not Hold on one second just give me two seconds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my son just came home and he doesn't realize that Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Um, so, um, oh, this seems like a, a quick question. Someone just last minute submitted. Do you listen to music while you write? If so, is there a specific band or type of music? 100% of the time, uh, I, or maybe 99% of the time I'm listening to music while I write. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, I have a whole playlist it's a lot of ambient music. Um, I guess like, an example might be like Stars of the Lid. Um, they have kind of, it has to be kind of um, open, but not too strong melodically. Definitely no lyrics. Um, William Basinski has some amazing loops that go on a really long time that, um, that I can listen to to write. Um, but I, yeah, I have a long playlist that I write and edit and read to. Olafur Arnolds sometimes is on there. Um, some Brian Eno, bunch of classical, um, but it has to be kind of slower and not too strong melodically. Um, Olin Mill is somebody that I like. Um, Christina Van Sue, Ernst Reidseger. Um, wow. Just to throw out some from my playlist. Thank you. Okay, so I think this should be the last question. This person wants to know, how can Native sympathizers, partners and social advocators and activists best support the Native population within the US, especially on Thanksgiving slash National Day of Mourning? It never occurred to me until reading your book that participating in the US Thanksgiving Day and events that are annual celebrations is an annual reminder to Natives and all of the atrocities keep upon them. As a black woman, I equated this to an annual celebration that reminds us of slavery and it being a good thing. My family instantly agreed that we will begin recognizing the national day of mourning on Thanksgiving. Instead, we will have a day of thanks for our blessings, not celebrating the US Thanksgiving on Friday. So this reminded me of the part in the novel where the, um, where the family is going to Alcatraz and they say, you know, we've been there before we go to celebrate, not celebrating Thanksgiving. And when I was living in Oakland, I used to go to the indigenous people's sunrise uh, ceremony on Alcatraz um, on that day and on indigenous people's day. And it's something I miss very much about living in the Bay area, but, you know, aside, I think what this person wants to know is aside from doing something in solidarity, like refusing to celebrate Thanksgiving and recognizing it as a national day of mourning, what else can hmm. non native people do um, to be I think allies and supporters? I think if you're if your heart's really in it, and it doesn't feel like homework, which I, I would hate for that to feel that way. Reading literature, other fiction writers, um, nonfiction, creative nonfiction poetry, watching documentaries, seeking out forms of art with contemporary Native people doing it um, is a really good way to, you can trust that the art will change you in ways that will be, will make you a good ally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can always look up local Native organizations and they always could use money as a, just a very basic way, but it, other ways that don't require opening your wallet, um, seek out native contemporary native art and um, try not to approach it 
as, as a labor or like a as homework, like I said. But really, if you if you're sincere about your allyship, um, the, the trust that the art will make you a better ally and it will give you better understanding of contemporary Native issues. Yes. Thank you so much for your openness and candor. Um, appreciate you very much sharing yeah, thank you. your responses to everyone's questions and really enjoyed so much this time with you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Alicia. And I just want to uh, close uh, again by uh, thanking you so much, uh, uh, Tommy Orange, for your amazing voice uh, and for your vision. Uh, and I want to definitely acknowledge uh, my colleague, Professor Elisa Carroll, for facilitating this conversation. I, I think it was very substantive. Uh, and finally, I, I just want to acknowledge all of you out there who are listening, uh, learning, uh, and engaging. I hope that this uh, was food for thought uh, and maybe knowledge for action. Uh, I want you also to remember that there'll be future events through UCI Big Read. Uh, and as we close up, I want to acknowledge the many people from the sponsoring organizations, including the Office of Inclusive Excellence, the UCI Libraries, and the UCI Division of Student Affairs. Thank you all and enjoy your day. <laughs>